Hey everyone, it's Susan Pierce Thompson and welcome to the weekly vlog. I am here with you today to answer a question from Eve from Sydney, Australia, one of my favorite cities in the whole wide world. After maybe San Francisco and Paris, but oh, tied up in there. Uh, she writes in, Susan, I heard your an you answer a question from Emily some weeks ago about Emily's experience of binge eating getting worse after following Brightline Eating for a while. This got me thinking further about addiction, particularly addiction to alcohol. Many recovering alcoholics report that when they pick up a drink after being sober for a while, sometimes years, it's as if the addiction has been silently progressing over all that time, whether they drink or not. Uh, so picking up a drink after say 10 years of being sober, they very quickly slide back into full on alcoholism as if they had never stopped. Is there science to explain this? If so, it would account for the experience of many bright line eaters who report that their food addiction is just as strong, if not stronger, when they break their bright lines. I myself have experienced the addictive power of bread after sticking to bright lines for several months. Bread had never been a trigger food to me, for me until I started bright line eating. Now it's a trigger food to the extent that I get obsessed by it. I would be fascinated to have your insights on this. Love to you and to all in the bright line eating family, Eve from Sydney. Oh, what a great question, Eve. Uh, yeah, there's science to explain that, absolutely. Um, I take issue with the idea that it's as if the disease of addiction has been progressing over all those years. Um, I think what, what the, the scientific reality is more like when we stop an addiction, we halt it, and then no matter how long we stay sober after that, if we pick it back up again, we're very quickly as, as bad as we ever were. I don't think it's fair to say that it's as if we might as well have been drinking or eating addictively all that time. But I do think very quickly, you're back as bad as it ever was. Now, in some cases worse with food, and let me explain that in a second. So here's the neuroscience to explain that. When we live our lives, we change our brain. Every day we're changing our brain. Um, when we're just doing the same old stuff, we're not changing our brain that that much, we're just fortifying the grooves, the fiber tracks that are already in existence in our brain. When we learn new stuff, now we're starting to rewire the brain in new ways. Now, um, the, the neural networks in the brain are called fiber tracks and um, it's, it's helpful to think of them like rivers because um, neural energy is electricity that flows through these pathways just like river flows through a riverbed. So if you think about the formation of a riverbed, this is really instructive, right? This is what it's like in the brain when we form a habit, when we form some kind of new skill or new behavior. It's like water's flowing and it starts to groove a riverbed. And the more often we do that thing in the same way, the deeper we groove that riverbed. So that's what we're doing with addiction is we're grooving that riverbed um, and then we stop. And what that means is we dam the river upstream and we divert that neural energy into a new pathway. That's why it's hard to just stop something. It's much easier to replace it with something else. So it's much easier to um, start doing bright line eating than it is to, for example, just stop binge eating. Someone who, who's got binge eating disorder who just tries to stop binging is probably going to find it very difficult to be successful. Whereas when you give them a whole program of new things to focus on and bright line eating and new habits and new structures, what we're doing is we're giving that neural energy, that water somewhere new to flow. And it's hard at first because that water doesn't have a riverbed that's well grooved. So it's kind of like the awkwardness of water flowing over flat land, not knowing where to go. But over time, a baby riverbed gets grooved and then a deeper riverbed and then a deeper riverbed gets grooved. Um, so this is one of the reasons why it's kind of silly to say it takes 66 days to form a habit, which is the best estimate we've got in the psychological literature because how many days does it take to form a riverbed? Well, if it takes 66 days on day 68, you've got a better one. And then on day 100, you've got a better one. So you just kind of keep grooving that riverbed. So what happens if you go back to the old addiction? Well, it's like, what happens if you let up the dam? The riverbed is still there. Now, it might take a couple weeks or a, few, a, a little bit of time 
to feel like it always felt because there might have been shrubs and grasses growing up in that old riverbed. The neural networks are kind of rusty, so to speak. So um, you let water start to flow and it might not come back like that. It might, it might, but it might not. But soon enough, it'll be right back to where it was um, because that old riverbed is still there. And there's mountains of literature explaining that um, even when you think something has gone extinct in the brain, like a behavior hasn't been manifest in a long, long time, even in training dogs or pigeons, you can make their behaviors go extinct so that they never manifest them. And then years later or long periods of time later, you can go back and retrain them and, and they pick it up like that as if, as if no time had passed. And so there's a lot of evidence that in the brain, old patterns of behavior don't really go away they just kind of go underground uh, like i studied french from fifth grade through when i dropped out of high school um i don't know if you knew that about me i'm a high school dropout but anyway when you're a phd no one asks you if, if you graduated from high school it's just a little trick um but i studied french for all those years whatever it was five six seven years i don't remember um and then i went to paris once and practiced it more there um, i haven't spoken french at all in 20 years at the age of 80, I could pick up French and I'd be pretty good at it again in no time. Like those, those fiber tracks are still in the brain. So that's the science that explains why it's still there when you go back to it. Now, what explains the bread thing? You brought up a cool thing with the bread thing and you brought up a cool thing with, with food addiction, it seems sometimes worse. And I think with food addiction, it is often worse because in the interim, like the alcoholic in the interim, they've just been abstaining from alcohol. Their body's very happy with them about that. Their body's not angry with them for abstaining from alcohol. Our bodies are angry with us because we've been starving it of calories and, and sustenance, right? Like we've been on a weight reduction food plan, which brings with it all kinds of other issues. The body doesn't like weight loss it's it's been trained through a, like lots of millennia to think that weight loss is a scary thing because it means that food is in short supply and the body undergoes adaptations to slow down the metabolism and to make hormonal changes to make it imperative that the moment there's food available you'll gobble it up and so that's why with food addiction in particular, but in my opinion, not alcoholism and drug addiction, it can seem like the addiction is worse if you go back to it after a period of abstinence. Um, there's some really cool research coming out of Australia, and I wanna do some similar research within the Bright Line Eating community on um, hormonal changes from weight loss. Now they just had people for 10 weeks stay on a 550, uh, calorie diet a day, 500, that's not much. The Bright Line Eating Plan is double that at least or more, um, around double that. But not, it's not much food for 10 weeks. And at the end of 10 weeks, their bodies showed all kinds of markers of starvation, changes in leptin and ghrelin and all these peptides and all sorts of sort of ancillary circulating neuropeptides and neurotransmitters and hormones that are related to the regulation of eating and satiety and so those people really were you know eating intensely to regain their lost weight so anyway we don't really see that as much after someone's lost their weight and they've been on maintenance for a while our bodies really do seem to adapt well to our new set point so i really want to do the research um, to explain why that is i'm really curious about that um, i think it's it might have something to do with the healthy manner in which we lose our weight huge quantities of vegetables and really healthy eating patterns and so forth it's not a starvation plan at all so anyway let's talk about the bread thing um, I experienced that too. I never was interested. I'm not a bread person. I was never into flour as much as sugar. In my experience, about 20% of the food addicted population is, prefers flour. Like I don't care about sweets, but don't take, don't take away my bread, my pizza, my pasta, my muffins, my bagels. And about 80% of people are more sugar focused, but usually it's combination. It could be cookies or ice cream or things like that, but it's gotta be sweet. Um, I also turned into a flour addict after I took out sugar. So there was a period of time back in a previous 12-step program, whatever it was, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when I was abstaining from sugar but not flour, and I experienced a powerful flour addiction start to develop. And my opinion about that is 
the brain will take its drug from wherever it needs to get it from. It doesn't care, really. I mean, the dopamine receptors in the brain, they just want to rush. They don't really care if it comes from gambling or it comes from shopping or it comes from s pornography or it comes from alcohol. Like, they don't really care. So if you're depriving it of its fix, it's going to it's very easy for that addiction to hop onto something else. And in your case, it's hopped onto flour, bread. So fine. Um, that's not surprising. That's why in AA, people are smoking cigarettes and sucking down coffee outside the meetings because they've stopped drinking and they, their brain still needs that dopamine fix and they're eating donuts, right? So um, anyway, so yeah, there's lots of good reasons why um, when we uh, go back to our addiction after a long period of time, it, it feels super bad again right away and this riverbed analogy explains why you know if you are doing bright line eating and you want to stay happy thin and free you got to keep on the pathway you got to keep doing what you got to keep that dam in the in the top of the river the, the river so that you're you keep diverting that neural energy in the new direction right that's kind of the way it works and um my guess is that by the time you get to go weight that'll seem like a pretty good deal so that's the weekly vlog. If you have something you want me to address in the weekly vlog, send it in. I'm at susan at brightlineeating.com. I'll see you next week.